Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Arbata with Mary Gamble with a darker, richer blue background. Uh, Mary, thank you for kicking things off. Before we bring on our good friend, Mike Marin, the president and CEO of Holy Name Medical Center. Talk about an innovator and leader. Tell everyone who the sponsors of Lessons in Leadership are, please. Yeah, thanks so much. We have Valley Bank, Prager Metis, the New Jersey Sharing Network, the, uh, I'm going to look at my list because I don't want to miss anybody. Kessler I can Foundation. do it by heart. You ready? The International. No, no, don't even engineers. make me look Go. bad. Don't make no. me look bad. I'm going to start over, not the show, just my, my funders. All right, you ready? Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Kessler Foundation, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Seton Hall University, and the Bacino Leadership Institute, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Not bad. Now, not bad. Me, not bad. Mike, let me ask you this. And by the way, our good friend Mike Marin has been on lessons in leadership before. Mike, is it me or do most CEOs, people lead organizations, have the sponsors and those who pay the bills literally rolling around in their head 24 7? Is it just me, Mike? Because you no, raise a lot just, of money too. Yes, we do. And so all those major donors are always rattling around yeah. in the head as well. <laughs> My problem is, Mike, and I do have to share, I have one of our underwriters, our sponsors, as an acronym, IUOE Local 825. So that's the one I always have to pause with because doing the longer form, that's where I hesitate. Am I'm I making not? an excuse, I know. I'm making no. an excuse. No, no, no. I'm not a fan of acronyms. I always say spell it out. I yeah. know, I know. Um, Mary will give me heat for this later, but it's all right. Hey, Mike, listen, we had a great conversation yesterday. Uh, Holy Name is one of the major underwriters of our public broadcasting work. And, and Mike, when I talk about leadership all the time, I believe we're actually doing a, an upcoming uh, seminar with the Commerce and Industry Association, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, but Mike, one of the things you told me about this, and I want to get right into it, and it wasn't part of our script, is that Mike has got a background and is very interested and educated in technology and the digital world and a bunch of other things. He's in the middle of a meeting with us yesterday and he's sort of time out. I got to show you a screen. And I'm like, how did he just do that? I barely got on Zoom. <laughs> what do so you mean, Mike, Steve? You're, Steve, you are amazing with technology. Come on. Stop. You're joking. <laughs> Mike and I are comparable in our very youthful appearance and age and a bunch of other things. I know nothing. You know everything. Where did that come from? And what the heck does that have to do with leadership, your technological, digital innovation background, Mike? So it, it came early on in my, in my career, Steve, when I graduated from undergrad um, and started in the, in the finance division, I knew and I had trained in school. Back then, you would do computer programming on these punch cards and you'd have to run them through these compilers, right? It was a very different system. Uh, personal computers and cell phones didn't exist. Uh, or I should say the personal computer itself was just coming into existence. And so in my, my very first job at Valley Hospital, this is a true story. Uh, one of my mentors, good, good man, good leader, Rich Keenan, was the chief financial officer at Valley for many, many years. And I came to him and I would sit there all day with these calculators doing these manual calculations and writing on, on accounting spreadsheets. And I said to him, I said, you know, Rich, they have a thing now, it's called a personal computer. And if we were to buy one, I could actually automate a lot of this stuff. It would increase accuracy and save a lot of time. And I could, and other staff could spend more time actually engaging around the numbers as opposed to compiling the numbers. And he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, no, it's, just, it's called a personal computer. So he told me, he says, look, I'm gonna, we're gonna go ahead and buy one. It's the first personal computer ever purchased by Valley Hospital. So I'm gonna put it in your office and you have six months to prove to me that this machine will work. And if it doesn't, you and the machine are out of here. <laughs> for real? True, yeah, true story, for real. I love it. What, what did you take away? First of all, it obviously worked. What did you take away from all that? And what the heck does that have to do with leadership? Well, so here's the thing that, that for me, which especially, it doesn't matter what industry and what sector you're in. It was a major moment in my life that here, you know, 40 years later has now stayed with me. So I ended up automating a, a budget reporting process onto old, large floppy disks and an old dot matrix printer and created this, at the time, automated budget system. In order to get it run, I had to pull an all-nighter and because the dot matrix printer would jam. 
And so I had to stay there and he ended up staying at the hospital all night long. Keenan comes walking in in the morning, walks past my office, looks at me and says, you had that suit on yesterday, right? Knew full well I was there all night long. He said, uh, he goes, is, is the report ready? I said, yeah, it actually is. He said, all right, grab it, come down to my office uh, when you're ready and uh, let's talk about it. So the thing finishes printing, I pull off a stack of folded computer paper, you know, this thick, walk into his office. He hands me a cup of coffee, right? So kind gesture and says, sit down. He says, so what is this? I, I explained to him what it is. And he said, all right, let me see. And he flips all the way to the back page. And he looks at the summation on the back page, takes his pen out as only Keenan can do. Now here's a man who never had a computer to the day he retired, never had a computer on his, on his desk only relied on other people to do the calculations, had an old phone with a million punch mm. buttons on it where he saved favorite numbers, right? That was his style. Flips all the way to the back page, picks his pen out, circles it, says, see that number? I said, yep, it's wrong. <laughs> My head exploded. I was like, are you out of your mind? Cannot be. He said, I'm telling you it's wrong. I said, Rich. And he saw me get, he goes, look, do me a favor. I know you were here all night. Go home, shower, try to get some sleep, come back, look at the at your report, and then come see me and let's talk about why I can tell you that number's wrong. So I did what he said. I went home. I was exhausted, slept, showered, went back, started combing through all the all the reporting and the details. Sure enough, there was a calculation error. The number was wrong. And so I go down to his office and he and I said, embarrassing. I said, you're right. The number was wrong. Here's a revised report. How'd you know? And he told me, he said, let me tell you something. One of the best lessons you can ever learn, especially if you're going to come up in the financial side of this business, numbers on a spreadsheet are just numbers on a spreadsheet until you know where those numbers come from. He said, I've been at this hospital long enough and I've walked the halls. I know what creates the numbers. And by knowing what creates the numbers, I know when a number is right and when a number is wrong. So I got to ask you, Mike, first of all, I thought I knew you well and clearly did not know that story. As a, as a leader, as a CEO, that story, that experience has had what impact on you as a leader? So for me, very important, my entire career has been devoted to always spending time on the floors, in the operating rooms. I'm one of the few CEOs who will go in there and put scrubs on and actually round through the ORs while live surgery is going on and talk to the surgeons because I'm fascinated by the actual delivery of medicine and what's happening. And if I sit in my C Tower suite relying on computers and data only, and I don't know where those numbers come from, then I'm doing a disservice to the organization because I don't really, that's only part of the story. And you have to understand where wow. the numbers come from in order to make effective change. Boy, Keenan, speak, everyone's had mentors in our lives, but Keenan was a big mentor for you. Mary, jump in. Yeah, Mike, how do you, with the culture and the DNA, especially during COVID this past 18 months plus by the time this airs, how do you instill that same level of caring and culture from the person that's at the reception desk to your patient reps, to the nurses? How do you instill that as a culture um, at Holy Name? Well, for us, Mary, believe it or not, I, because we are one of the last remaining um, faith-based organizations in healthcare, right? They're all pretty much gone. Holy Name is, uh, when I had started in New Jersey, there were 16 Catholic hospitals. Um, once St. Peter's and Trinitas merge, complete their merger into Robert Wood Johnson, they're gone. St. Joe's is partially, you know, partnered with Hackensack Meridian. They'll start to lose their uh, Catholic identity as a result. That leaves us, right? And part of it's our independence and we're independent Part, largely because of our Catholic beliefs and our structure. So it makes, me, it makes it easy for us to fall back on that and talk about mutual respect for people and why we're in this. And it's not about a paycheck and it's not about a job. Those are important. And we want everybody you know, earning a living and being safe and comfortable and having families and having a balanced life. 
but you have to know the reason why you're here. And so when you can walk around and not have an air about you, right? So one of the things early on in my career, it actually goes back to the Valley days. I swore when I was just an underling. So I'm also one of the few CEOs. I never just jumped out of a grad school program into an executive position. I was a staff person when my first job, I was just a budget analyst at Valley Hospital. I wasn't a manager. I was a staff person. Worked my way up to a manager, worked my way up to be in the, in the executive suite along my career. And so early on, and it was an accelerated rise, but I always was in touch with the rank and file. And so I vowed never, I don't want people, I get very uncomfortable when people call me Mr. Marin. I want them calling me Mike. And that's only because I want them knowing that, that I am no better than them. I am just fortunate and blessed to be in this job, mm. but I am an individual just like you, subject to the same frailties, mistakes, and flaws that we all have but also the same beliefs and celebration of success. We are aligned. And if you see me that way and I see you that way, then that's a respectful relationship, a mutually respectful relationship that can grow and nurture and, and tell us you know, where we go. So um, you had COVID early on. I did. You said this before on Lessons in Leadership. We're taping this at the end of June, 2021. It'll be seen after that. That's why Mary mentioned the 18 or so months. But this is what I'm curious about. Not only the experience of having COVID, but leading um, a hospital where COVID was devastating, particularly early on. One area, one way in which you, has, you have evolved or changed as a leader is? Uh, so for me, it was the, the ability to again, just be on the front lines, to be fully engaged, to be attentive. Yeah, but you always did that, Mike. Come on. Yeah, but it, it, when, when you're in the middle of a crisis like this, Steve, you have to take it to a higher level, right? There, I'll tell you, um, what struck me in COVID, again, this is a true story. So December 2019, pre right before pre-COVID, pre-COVID, like I've done for the last 40, 50 years, right? Uh, my wife and I are in Manhattan, Christmas time, go up to see St. Patrick's. I, I knew St. Patrick's was coming into this story. Go ahead. Right? <laughs> Better than this. Walk through Rockefeller Center. You've walked through Rockefeller Center, right? See the tree? In the middle of Rockefeller Center is a monument. And engraved on the monument is a document called the Rockefeller Creed. I walk past that monument it's got to be hundreds of times, hundreds. Never once did I notice it, pay attention, or stop and read it. Never did. For some reason, December 2019, it caught my eye. I stopped. I read it. I took a picture of it to re remind myself. Came back, Googled the, the Rockefeller Creed. It is an incredibly powerful document with an incredible set of beliefs. There's nine verses to it. One, all of them resonate with me. There's one that stuck out all through COVID and it's, and it's towards the end and it goes like this. I believe the rendering of useful service is the common duty of all mankind. Only in the purifying fires of sacrifice is the dross of selfishness consumed and the greatness of the human soul set free. I don't so know we're going to get that deep today. My, wow. my head <laughs> right now. The biggest thing you took from that is? We all have, so in the crisis, those who stepped up, sacrificed. And in sacrificing, they put selfishness aside. They thought of others ahead of themselves. And we saw the greatness of the human soul set free. We witnessed it here firsthand. And that's what gave us the strength and the fortitude and, and, the, and compelled us to do what we did. And Mike, every time you join us, we not only learn something new, but we understand you from a different perspective. Thank you for being so open and vulnerable and, and, and looking deeper. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you. This is uh, Lessons in Leadership, Steve, Mary, Mike Marin. Uh, I'll be right back right after this. 
This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Arabato, Mary Gamba. You're just listening to uh, Mike Marin. Interesting perspective. The whole computer story was deep and, and impactful. And I didn't know that about, about yeah. Mike Marin. I, I love every time we talk to Mike, he shares a new story. He is one of the top five storytellers that I've ever met. His stories stick, they resonate, they share great examples that are relevant. I always joke with my kids, I said, I was alive before computers, that was black and white television, before cell phones, and they're like, what do you mean? And I said, I remember Christmas, getting the first Atari video game and getting a Commodore 64 and, and just thinking it was so cool. And, and now to know that there's uh, the internet and email and we've just come such a long way in such a little amount of time. Yeah, by the way, we're gonna be going into an interview I did with First Lady Tammy Murphy. Uh, she talks about a range of issues. Listen, she's a leader. Um, she's not the governor, as we do this program. She's the governor's wife, who's very actively engaged. But Mary, it's got me curious about something. Um, we're not here to analyze um, Phil and Tammy Murphy's marriage or their power dynamics. But I am fascinated by this. Uh, who's the leader in the Gamba house? <laughs> it's 50 50 Steve do you believe that <laughs> I'll tell you something though one thing Bill and I were friends uh before Bill would we be your were husband. <laughs> uh, oh yeah my husband is this Bill. Guy Bill so, that lives here the father of my two Bill kids that lives, yeah the father of my children so Bill and I met I was 14 he was 16 so we were friends and became best friends before we ever got romantically involved and decided to get married and have a family and because of that, we, we each had our separate lives, but then we also learned how to negotiate and, and share responsibilities and, and just be that way together. And I truly believe that the best leaders, and especially in the case of, again, I mean, this isn't about politics, but it's a matter of a give and take and negotiation and everyone giving into the relationship and also knowing their strong points. I can't cook. So build us a cooking. I do the cleaning and the laundry. He does the yard work. So we, we divide and conquer. Um, you would never want to eat a meal that I make, that's for sure. You, so you're saying you're not a great cook? No, no. Like well, I, I can cook a Thanksgiving dinner for whatever reason. I think my mom taught me how to do that perfectly. But other than that, I can't cook. Like if there's ingredients in the refrigerator and I need to put them together, I'll just have a bowl of cereal and I'll be happy. Well, let, let me try this one on you. Um, my wife, Jennifer, can't hear me, right? Okay, I'm taping out of our house. <laughs> Uh, my wife, Jennifer, I said this before, she has a company called Staged and Styled. She stages homes. She actually staged the home we live in right now because she made it look great and it was great. And then she made it look even better. And Mary's been through the house. She knows it's a, it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice home. And the reason I say this is because Jennifer is a good cook, but she's working so much with her company, Staged and Styled, that it's one of those things where you, this whole idea of, a, and it's going to date myself in so many ways, but as a woman becomes a stronger leader, or if a man becomes a stronger leader in a relationship, it's not who the primary breadwinner is. It's not. It's, I get the 50-50 thing you're saying, and I don't know how much you're being PC or how much it's real. Oh, no, I'm really not. I, I, I but 50, genuinely- But Mary, here's the problem with that argument. Jen and I, I'm sure it's not the case with you and Bill, we disagree about a lot of things about parenting our approach, mm -hmm. our styles. Are, so what's 50-50? Oh, well, we are talking about responsibilities, right? I, I, I was solely talking about responsibilities. How about we decision, have... no, take responsibilities out. Mm -hmm. Because I do the, re I take out the recycling and the garbage and I'd like a gold medal yep. for it. I would like the gold medal around my week every, <laughs> every time I do it. 
So or, or pick up the kids. It's you know, that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm joking about that, but not totally. Decision making is 50 50. It really is. It, it, and I'm telling you, one day you can sit down and, and we'll have coffee with me, you, Bill and Jen and have that conversation. And it really is because there's certain things that I very, I'm very passionate about, right? That the decision, I'm going to stand my ground. And there's other things that I really don't really care about. And if he decides that if he wants to do this or that, and so usually vacations and what we're going to do with our spare time, I'll decide um, what we're going to do in terms of yard work or what new car we buy or what, you know, any of those things, I don't care about any of that. So it really is, even our retirement plans, I, I'm really leaning toward him to say, all right, what do you want to do? And thankfully we have the same ideas. So I genuinely can say it's 50-50 when it comes to really making challenging decisions. Tell you what, a great show at the appropriate time is Bill and Mary Gamba, Jan yes. Steve Arabato talking about power dynamics in the home. Let's do it. I love it. That sounds like a fun show. That, that's leadership. It's life. And speaking of a powerful couple, as we do this program in the summer of 2021, Phil Murphy is the governor. Yes, there's an election, by the way, in our other program. We'll have the yeah, governor. This will air before then. Yeah, but no, we'll have the governor and his Republican opponent talking about policy issues. But right now, uh, this is a very strong leader. She's the first lady of the great state of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy, and she can clearly speak for herself. Steve, out about a more important, the first lady of the great state of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. Uh, Tammy, thank you for joining us on Talk, Talk Leadership. Thank you, Steve, as always, for having me. Let me ask you this. Um, where did you learn to be the leader that you are? <laughs> um, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm humbled and honored that you think I'm a leader. I, I think I just put my head down and I just try to, to, to do everything I can. And, and I mean that. I mean, um, well, there's I, Nurture and Jay. There's a pandemic relief fund. There's a whole Put it this way. The governor's the governor. He's the leader of our state. The first lady is a leader. Just check out our portfolio. So let's get that out of the way. <laughs> Where does your drive to be the leader you are come from? Um, I Listen, I was raised uh, as a child. My grandmother and grandfather were involved in a million things in the community, as, as was my father. And I think I've always um, had that nagging concern to look out for the people around me. And, you know, I, I feel really honored that I'm in a position where I can't actually affect change and help people. And so for me, it's, it's really um, a, daily, a daily drive to figure out how can I make a challenge over here and opportunity over there? And what pieces of the puzzle do I need to bring? I've got a great platform to be able to bring people together and I do not hesitate to use that where I think I can really help. Well said, I got a quick follow-up. Sure. Resilience, grit, toughness, um, I mentioned, we're taping actually this conversation on the 16th of February on March 4th was when um, the governor had an operation related to cancer diagnosis and the first COVID case. And he was back to work right away and you were shoulder to shoulder with him. Where does your, where does his grit come from? Um, well, you know what, we are a team in every sense of the word. When, when I am feeling tired, Phil's got energy and vice versa, where I might, say, you know, I think we should go to the right. Phil will say, actually, we got to go to the left. We are, we are really a great balance of one another and we keep each other in motion. Um, you know, the grit piece, uh, my, my high school um, taught me, we had, a, we had a motto, which was non sippy which is not for oneself. Not non for oneself. Not for oneself. And uh, that's something I think I, I've lived with for a long time. But I will tell you, Steve, we've got an incredible incredible state. And, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. The Pandemic Relief Fund, not only did individuals step up, but corporations have leaned in. And, and I've seen the best of the best. And the same thing, all of our artists, when I said I wanted to pull together that virtual hug with the Jersey for Jersey event, these artists did not hesitate. They went right. out of their way to accommodate. People are giving of themselves on a daily basis to make sure that that others in our state who are really being impacted are getting the resources they need. And, and it's incredible. Our whole state has got grit. Last question on that. You asked, you asked a lot of people and they said you asked and they said they were honored to do it. A big part of leadership is having the courage, the commitment, the passion to ask for help. Is that a too simplistic way to say it? Uh, no, I, that's probably right. I mean, I, I think I was fortunate enough to see I, I could see there was going to be a major problem, obviously, uh, the second this pandemic began. 
And I was really fortunate that I was able to communicate that concern to other people and others felt the same and wanted to do all they could to help those in need. And that's been, that's been an incredible, it's been, it's been really, it's really helped. It's, it's buoyed me for the entire time of this pandemic because working side by side with people virtually, by the way, I've, I've never met half the people on our board, but we work together. We, we talk all the time. Uh, they're on speed dial. Um, but people, people want to do good, especially in our state. And, and I, I could not be more proud of, of all that we've accomplished, but there's a lot more to do. That is uh, Tammy Murphy, who is the first lady in the Garden State, New Jersey, our state. Um, thank you so much, Tammy, for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. Thank you for having me, Steve. That was the uh, First Lady Tammy Murphy, a compelling interview. By the way, check out our sister website on our not-for-profit entity, uh, steveautobato.org, for interviews, uh, video of interviews with the First Lady and a whole range of other folks. Hey, Mary, listen, one of the things I love about Lessons in Leadership is we can talk about a lot of different things. Yeah, we're talking about power dynamics, relationship, leadership in a marriage, blah, blah, blah. I want to talk about something else called stubbornness, okay? So, um, and I've told you about some of my friends who are very stubborn and who is stubborn about the vaccine, not getting it, who's stubborn about, they're convinced of the politics. And I don't try to convince people of, that they're wrong, but I try to bring up different perspectives. But when I decide I'm right, I'm digging in. <laughs> oh, you I'm never. Digging, well, I'm digging in. My heels are firmly into cement. I'm trying to, I'm digging in. And I, the question is, when you dig in, because you're convinced you're right, or you've been aggrieved, you haven't been appreciated, whatever it is, what the heck does that have to do with leadership and relationships? Well, it, it has everything to do, especially with leadership. If you dig into the point that you're putting your head in the sand and you're not listening to others' perspectives, you are going to create a massive roadblock, no matter what it is that you're trying to do. If it's in the family, like, look at you. You're talking about, you know, there's been a challenge. You're you're trying to overcome. If, if it, Stop, it, Mary. It, it, I'm going to put it right out. We don't play code games here. All right. All right. So, so it's a cup of coffee. <laughs> my wife, Jennifer, and I got into a ridiculous <laughs> argument. I didn't think she was understanding where I was coming from. She said I wasn't listening to her. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. I know I'm blessed, believe me, I know. And I was like, listen, she's wrong on this one and I'm not backing down. And she got even more whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and then she, you ended up spiting She makes me a great cup of, uh, cappuccino every morning. I need it. And I saw it wasn't there. I was like, I'm going, getting my own. I don't even care. Like yep. I was, it was a big deal. And I said, I don't care if you ever make me coffee again. She goes, don't worry about it ain't going to happen. Yep. And I go right away, like I'm dug in, she's dug in. I want the coffee tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to get it or not. What are we supposed to give in is the question. I think that you are supposed to compromise. Giving in to me sounds like it's black or white, one way or the other. To Wave me, the white flag, I'm, I'm tapping out. Nope, nope. You're going to compromise. You're going to have an adult conversation as two adults do, decide how this argument happened, and then never, ever, ever go to bed angry. That is one thing that I never, What well, we did last go night, I'm going to admit that. Why is that bad? And what it's does horrible that because then that's the probably life. what caused Coffee Gate this morning. That's probably why you guys ended up arguing this morning because you went to bed angry. Never do it. You don't have to be all lovey dovey, but don't go to bed angry. Hey, Jen. She's gone. And, and I love Elvin. Elvin's uh, goodbye message. He's our director who tells us when it's over. It said, Your wife said to say goodbye. <laughs> so goodbye. Uh, Elvin's my, my director broadcast wife. Well, that sounds, never mind. Not the, Mary, Mary's my Thanks work. for joining us here on News 12 Plus and all the other places. Have a good morning. I'm going to stop talking before I get myself in trouble. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.